Um, so the modern age of whaling was using high speed diesel or coal powered steamboats, compressors, exploding harpoons. And that put all the fast and large whales previously protected by their speed and tendency to sink within range of the whalers. So whales like blue whales, fin whales, humpback whales were also now targeted along with the few remaining right whales. You folks on Orcas Island, let's see, stand by, it's not advancing. Folks on Orcas Island are gonna recognize the name on the back of this boat. Uh, this is a whale whaling boat built uh, in Moran shipyards in Seattle. That's the same Moran, of course, as Moran State Park on Orcas Island. Um, this boat was built to go whale uh, out of Kodiak Island uh, um, uh, in Alaska, of course. And this boat, along with a handful of others, uh, was responsible for taking kind of the last few remaining right whales that were swimming in the North Pacific of that ocean at that time. And then in 1935, right whales were protected worldwide. The first species of whale, along with gray whales in the same treaty that were, to, that were ever protected in the world. And one of the first international treaties to protect an animal or a species, which I think is pretty cool. It sets an interesting precedent, of course. Um, but it, it, there were few whales left at the time when they were protected, few right whales. But it was thought that the, the population was recovering uh, in the North Pacific until the 50s when, uh, when communist era, era models of production and efficiency doomed the whales for a third time. So Soviet factory fleets targeted all the whales in the North Pacific uh, and likely killed the majority of the recovering population of right whales. So this illegal harvest was a secret uh, and the fail, failure for right whales to recover in, in the North Pacific was a bit of a mystery until um, until quite recently when a scientist who lives in the States but is Russian uh, named Yulia Vashenko happened to have like a, a couple random or like chance conversations with, with whale biologists that had been on those uh, Soviet factory ships who mentioned some data they had about right whales. And it was not thought that they had killed right whales. But it turns out that in the 50s and the 60s, the Soviet whaling fleet in the North Pacific killed 681 right whales, which again was probably the bulk of the population that was in the North Pacific. Uh, and then as I, this, is the, this is the book that I was holding up in that picture called On the Northwest. If you guys have any questions or are interested in like that chunk, the, the historic whaling chunk of the, of the story, this book, uh, is really dense and boring to read unless you're into reading about the history of whaling. But if you are at all curious about it, it's like we're lucky to have all that data in one place and some just really cool photos. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I highly recommend checking it out. It's a, through this book, I've learned a ton about a uh, uh, chunk of the history of the Northwest that I didn't know and, and exactly how important whaling was and to settling this place. And in industry, you know, the, the last whaling station that closed uh, in the Northwest was Coal Harbor on Vancouver Island in 1967. There was a whaling station in Warrington, just out of Astoria in the, in the early, late 50s, early 60s. We had a whaling station at Westport uh, in, in the early part of the century. So uh, it's super interesting stuff that, yeah, I just had not ever, ever been introduced to until I kind of started on this journey reading about right whales. Um, so thankfully, North Pacific right whales are no longer whaled or hunted commercially, uh, but they're still, uh, humans are very likely still causing mortality to these whales. So we know from North Atlantic right whales that entanglement and ship strikes are the two leading causes of mortality for whales, uh, for North Atlantic right whales. Um, and so we think that those are also causes a, a human caused mortality for North Pacific right whales. Uh, and research techniques pioneered by some folks in Seattle have modeled that even ship noise uh, can stress out right whales. There's like a super cool and kind of random uh, research project that was going on 
on the Atlantic coast when 9-11 happened. These guys were, they collected whale scat using a scat sniffing dog. And if you are in the San Juans, maybe you've heard they also do that with orcas. It's like an insanely cool and non-invasive way to get data about whales um, that, that I Google it. It's really cool. Like I could talk on and on about that as well. But so these guys were doing this uh, on the Atlantic coast with Atlantic right whales. And from those scat samples, they can get, they can measure stress hormone. There's all sorts of information in there, but one of the things is stress hormone levels. And so they were pre 9-11 measuring stress hormone levels in North Atlantic right whales. And then directly after 9-11, still measuring those, those stress hormone levels in, in right whales. And of course, after 9-11, there was two weeks, almost a month, where there was no shipping coming in and out of the East Coast. And so the oceans were quieter than they'd been in a century. And they could, these researchers were able to show that right whale stress levels went down with that noise. And that, like it's the graph showing this, that it's pretty beautiful how the two things look really tied together. So a quieter ocean, less stress for the whales, which of course means in the, any of the shipping or that sort of activity in the North Pacific of which there is a ton shipping and fishing, it's also causing stress to these whales, if not a, a direct cause of mortality. Uh, I had given a similar talk uh, almost exactly a year ago. And, and one of the things that people were curious about is the effects of the pandemic on, on whale populations. And, and at the time, we, no one knew, and we still don't know because there's not any, any data back really, but it was interesting to think that there was, again, maybe this little blip as shipping slowed down and commercial fishing activity really slowed down uh, as the demand went down, that there was this little blip uh, in the North Pacific where the whales were interacting less with fishing gear and, and shipping traffic and, and shipping noise. Um, it's just one of these things that, that, that shows that uh, we should probably be paying closer attention uh, to these whales to understand exactly how all these things affect them. Um, but typically North Pacific right whale search is focused in their critical habitat on the Southeast Bering Sea. Uh, in, a, in a good year, there's a team underway to look for them out there. Uh, but in most years it's left up to a few hydrophones uh, which is like an underwater microphone that record right whale songs uh, if the right whales are present and singing. Um, that we have a favorite, my, my group of, of right whale friends has a favorite hydrophone. This is the one behind me. There's one on the, on the bottom of that buoy. I think I probably have a picture in here somewhere of it named Peggy. That, that specific hydrophone records more right whales than, than any other one. Um, this is a woman named Jess Krantz. Uh, I like to say that Jess Krantz is the baddest ass woman in a field populated by badass women. Uh, she is the, uh, she's an expert on whale acoustics and North Pacific right whales. Much of our contemporary knowledge about North Pacific right whales comes from Jess and her team at NOAA. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so she, like I said, expert on acoustics. And if you want to learn about right whales, it, it turns out that one of the easiest way, it's not easy, but one of the easier ways to do it is to do it through acoustics. So listening with, with hydrophones for the whales. Um, Jess has spent the past two summers as one of the only women and the only non-Japanese speaking crew on board this boat as part of an international whaling commission survey of the North Pacific. This boat may look familiar to some of you uh, when it's not doing surveys. It's been a catcher boat for the Japanese uh, research harvest of minke whales in the Southern Ocean. Maybe you've seen it on, on a TV show or some documentary about that. Um, it's a super bummer that Jess has to conduct her research off a, a whale boat. Uh, but a couple interesting side notes. She says they're really good at driving up to the whales when they find them. Uh, and her research using acoustics off this whaling boat um, can models to the International Whaling Commission and to the, to the Japanese government and research program that using non-invasive research uh, also gets you good data on whales. So Bummer that she has to use this boat. It's a, it's a sign of how much funding that our government's putting towards uh, uh, researching these whales. But it is, there are uh, some interesting things that, that have come out of it. 
Um, but Jess has done some heroic work out there and spent some pretty heroic time at sea getting this data. Um, so the last two summers, Jess has been sending sono buoys over the side. This is like a, uh, another little hydrophone that was designed to listen for submarines by the Navy that the, the Navy kindly donates to the right whale research program. And so they go out there where they think there's right whales, they run a transect, they throw these hydrophones over uh, and they listen. Uh, so imagine sitting in this boat in the, basically in front of a computer with your headphones on, listening for how I probably 18 hours a day, knowing Jess, maybe more, uh, into to an ocean that's full of all sorts of noise, but, but not full of right whale calls. And then maybe if you're lucky, one a month or something, you, you hear a right whale and, and then they're able to triangulate on it if they have a few of these out and they can hopefully go find and, and ID that right whale. And so if they hear a right whale, this, Carol, give me a thumbs up if you're able to hear this here in a sec, but this is what they sound like. We heard the beginning, but then after that, not. Oh, oh, weird. Okay. Um, strange. Well, I'll, uh, I'll describe rather than dig into the technology that, that made that happen. Uh, there's two call types that, that you would have heard there. You can see on the, on the screen here, there's these ones called gunshot calls. And then these little ones called up calls. You can see them, uh, see them go up. So, Pretty cryptic. It sounds a little bit like ocean noise, but it is a North Pacific right whale. Um, oh, are you hearing that? <laughs> okay. I'll let it play for a sec here. Oh, and that one stopped. Stand by. <laughs> okay, sorry. There we go. Up calls. Um, so this is a. This is the uh, multi-screen technology snafu I was talking about. Um, so Jess and her team, uh, just just to show a little bit about how cool their work is and how cool right whales are. Jess and her team were the first to document through these recordings that North Pacific right whales, unique among all three species of right whale, are singing. So they're not just making these calls, they're actually making these calls in a pattern uh, and, and in a, in a, over the course of time that meets the biological definition of a song. So super cool. We don't actually know what they're doing when they're singing, but the, the guesses are uh, that it's probably some sort of mating and uh, or, or social thing, but but just go. It's I, I mean I just love the idea of these right whales swimming out there in the Bering Sea singing to each other. Um, super. They just published a paper uh, two years ago that that told that story. Uh, and then this, of course, is is Peggy that we're looking at here. That hydrophone I told you that gets more Northeast Pacific right whale calls than than any other. This is me in front of Peggy. That's kind of what I look like right now, but that was the real life. Uh, and so Peggy is right in the middle of the um, of their critic of the North Pacific right whale critical habitat that's in the Bering Sea. You can see uh, we accidentally, when we were out there a couple of years ago, accidentally drew a whale tail onto the chart plotter, and the uh, the apex of that tail there, where where we are, is right about where Peggy is. The boundaries of the uh, the critical habitat are those little whale icons, and so this this buoy is right about in the in the middle there. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so this, you know, from Peggy from Jess's work, we know a lot about. North Pacific right whales when they're in the Bering Sea, it's the, it's the place we hear them most and see them most. 
But Jess and everybody else agrees that we need to know where they're going out when they leave the Bering Sea uh, to, to help protect them. And so they leave the Bering Sea to calve and mate, we're pretty sure. And one of the reasons we know that is because on some years that all that critical habitat where they are is covered in ice. So of course they're not there then. And we also know because they turn up uh, at times outside the Bering Sea as well. Um, but real quick, before I get into the other spots that where they turn up, I just, uh, just a few photos from Lindsay who's on here somewhere, I see her name. And, and myself and a couple other folks did a voyage, hi Lindsay, <laughs> out to the Bering Sea and out to Peggy, obviously, to, to find North Pacific right whales. And it's just like the, the coolest part, well, and, and around Vancouver Island. Some of these pics are from around Vancouver Island. So can't say enough about the, the time I got to spend out there uh, filming and looking for these whales and, and spending time with my friends and all the other killer things we got to see while we were out there. Um, I love right whales, but also pretty excited about all other whales. So like the, the Pacific Ocean and the Bering Sea, it's just an incredibly rich place uh, with so much, uh, so many different ways to connect to the, to the life there. And then of course, like a pretty deep dive into the, to meeting people that have connections to this story. So Harry Hole here uh, is uh, put a human face and personality on the whalers from, from the whaling station on Vancouver Island for us. Uh, Harry worked at the whaling station uh, in, in, the 60, in the late 50s and 60s. Uh, and he lived there when the right whale was brought in in 1951. Uh, and this guy, Joey Ellerstein, uh just such an impressive dude that so this guy is like uh you wouldn't know it from talking to him because he'd never say anything but he's was super instrumental in putting a bunch of safety measures in place for seaplanes in british columbia and canada and it's just like an ace seaplane pilot that happens to own the the property where coal harbor uh whaling station was it's now the same buildings are used as a seaplane base and because he owns that property and also grew up in Coal Harbor, he's intensely interested in the history of whaling and that whale that was killed there in 1951. And I don't think I have a picture of it, but on the wall in the museum uh, is, is a chart of the, that the whaling boats use, and it shows a handful of their catches from, from, they had a chart like this from every year. So you can go through like, you know, 46, whatever, and see where they're catching whales that year. And he has on the wall of the museum, the, the chart from 1951 when that, that last right whale was killed. And what's really special to me about it is on the chart where, the, where that whale is, is a big grease smudge because he goes, every person that comes through, he tells about that right whale and shows them on the chart where it was. And he's always working on airplanes. So his hands are always, always greasy. So it's, he'll like be like, ah, oh, yeah, it's just a right whale. And then you know, do we know you like that thing a lot? So, you know, we, we have evidence, Joy. Super cool dude that we got to meet and, and learn about the, some of the history of this place. And then just being offshore and the Aleutians and the Bering Sea, there is, man, you know, the humpbacks we got to see and some of the other things. And then of course, time with my friends. This is Erob. She, Erob is currently studying whales in Wales. I don't think she was able to tune in tonight, but um, this is a cat named City Building Cat because uh, it lived at the city building in Accutan. This is Captain Carl on the Bering Sea, uh, pulling in a cod and looking like super serious and, and salty. Ali, his wife, uh making making dinner for us just a good time with friends voyaging and and uh get shaking off a little of the sadness that surrounds these whales while we're out there uh and and lots of time spent uh kind of in as a group creating this film and thinking about like our own personal connections to whales and what it means or what they mean to our lives what we can do to help and, and what tools we can bring to, to bear uh, to help their struggles. And this book, I have a pick here, has been 
this book actually came out after that trip and I'm currently almost through it. It is so good about talking about humans relationships to whales from a, from prehistoric to now and, and how we relate to these like, uh, Phil Clapham when we were interviewing him about right whales and, and he's talking about right, why we should stave them or something. And so, like, you know, we'd like to think all animals are, are made equally, but, but they're not like some have a more powerful presence in our lives and, and whales are certainly one of those things. And, and it's been really fun to reflect on that personally and then think about how to like weave that into the, to the story we're telling. And if any of that sounds curious to you guys, check out this book. It's so well, I can't say enough good things about this book. Super cool. I think you don't have to be a whale nerd to enjoy it either. Um, so as I mentioned, most of the right whales that we see, uh, we see in the Southeast Bering Sea um, and science is really curious about where they are when they occur outside of the Southeast Bering Sea. Um, and so in, if you look at a map of where they've been seen between 1996 and 2020, I would argue that we start to see a little bit of pattern of maybe where their, their uh, mating and calving grounds are, which of course, once we find that, it's, it's going to be crucially important to protect that, right? This is, I, I maybe skimmed over the part where, uh, where we think there's only a, about 30 North Pacific right whales left in the Northeast Pacific and probably about a couple hundred left off the Northwest Pacific on the Russian side and, and two separate populations. So critically small habitat, any, or, or sorry, critically small population, any sort of, of habitat that is important to them is vital to protect from activities that are gonna co be causes of mortality or stress for them. So likely fishing, uh, shipping, oil drilling, all, all things that, that can happen here in the, in the North Pacific. So is a, if just like starting to guess at where those other habitats are, if you look between 1996 and, and 2020, um, you can see that a little bit of a, of a pattern shows up. So here's a whale in 96 off of the end of Baja, whale in 96 off of Hawaii. This one is the only, this particular individual is the only right whale that's ever been matched from a Southern latitude to a Northern latitude. So a year later, this whale turned up uh, in the Bering Sea. So only one we, we know for sure has gone from, from the Southern latitudes, Northern latitudes. Uh, 1998 off of California. Then we there was a big gap. We skipped to 2013 off of Haida Gwaii. This one was found by a guy named James Pilkington, who is like uh, the man. He was very deserving of seeing this well. He had tried for long and hard to see it. And then this one here is the one I opened with off the Straits of Juan de Fuca at Swiftshire Bank. Two seen in 2015, and uh, these whales and a couple others in these sightings are unconfirmed, but I, I'm an optimist, so I like to think they're happy, healthy right whales that we're seeing. 2017, a couple turned up off California. 2018, Haida Gwaii again, a couple times. And then, uh, oh, sorry. And then 2020, last year, there was one seen by a mate on a container ship uh, off the coast of Vancouver Island who happened to be able to ID it from a poster they had in the bridge of the container ship and, and got a photo of it and, and knew from that poster to send the information to Noah, which is super cool. And then the big news in our circles is uh, last week, or uh, I got the phone call two days ago, but, but at the end of last week, there was a right whale seen again off Haida Gwaii. So uh, right about there uh, is, that, is where they were in 2018. This is a picture of it that, that just came out. So there's a pattern that's starting to develop. One of these whales turning up uh, almost once a year in the last decade, which is really special and heartening outside of the Bering Sea. And then of course, a pattern of them uh, you know, using the North Pacific Ocean all from Baja all the way up to the Bering Sea. Certainly for whales in Baja, it has to swim by California, it has to swim by, by Oregon and Washington and British Columbia. And so we can start to see in these, 
you know, a population of 30, the whales are not going to show up that much. So really, we do have a lot of sightings to, to, to make some judgments and conservation judgments on, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, this picture is that same whale. It's just gorgeous. I was talking to Lindsay on the phone before, right before this and just talking. I mean, for us to have spent so much time thinking about this whale, so to see this, it, it's really special for us and, and to know they're out there. Um, um, let's see. Uh, so, and just one, while I have everyone here, uh, I like to make this little plug when I'm talking to, to British Columbians or, or Washingtonians about this place that we call that this toy whale right here. We call them Pisces. This place in, in the picture that Pisces is looking at and where that, where Brian found the whale in 2013 is a place called Swiftshire Bank, which is in both in the U.S. and in Canada and is vitally important to, to humpback whales. When we were out there, uh, we saw a couple hundred humpback whales. Uh, it is vitally important, critical habitat for Southern resident killer whales of which you guys probably know um, are also in, in a kind of dire straits right now. That's a place we know that they, they spend a lot of time foraging. It also happens to be, if you see on this slide, uh, some major shipping lanes that go right through Swisher Bank is right out here. Uh, when we were out there looking for right whales and at humpback whales, we would periodically have to move out of the way of our filming to get out of the way of a large container ship that came through. So just a, a critical piece of habitat that we are as Washingtonians and we as, as U.S. citizens are responsible for that I feel we are not uh, doing the best for this, this piece of ocean. Um, and I'm gonna let Ira. E hopefully, you guys can hear this. I'm gonna let Erob tell you what it's like out there. This is a, a clip from out there. Erob, e what's it smell like right here? Mm, whales. <laughs> smell bad. Smell like where whales. are we? We're at Swisher Bank. We yeah. just saw like 300 whales. I know how packs. So as she says that, like it, it literally smelled like bad like whales out there, just like it's such a rich place and, and so cool to me that that's, you know, like a day sail from the San Juan Islands. It's, it's a two day sail from, from Seattle. It's just this, this piece of ocean and, and habitat that we're super lucky to have. Yeah. Oh God. Okay, there we go, a little tech issue. Here's a picture of Fomar from out there. Here's a right whale mm -hmm. from out there. Um, so I'm gonna end this by saying, uh, some reasons to care about the world's rarest whale. Yeah. Um, that one that we've had all these, we, science calls them extra liminal sightings, uh, which is they're outside their, what we consider their critical habitat. In the last decade, we've had all these, these new sightings. So it tells us that, that maybe the population is, in, is using the ocean differently than we think and that Maybe, maybe a message of hope would be that there's more whales than we think, which would be awesome. Um, there's important places that are used by these whales, like Swisher Bank, like probably Southern California, that are currently unprotected, that I would argue uh, need protection. Um, and uh, and I just you know love to do a plug that, that more funding and research needs to happen so that that we can protect these whales, I think it is, uh, I think it's wrong to let a species of whale go extinct uh, without doing everything we can to prevent that from happening. So thank you all for taking the time to listen to this talk. Let me see what, ooh, almost an hour there. That's good. I didn't, I was telling Carol, I didn't actually time my presentation. So it's just winging it timing wise. Um, if you guys are curious to get involved in North Pacific right whale efforts or whale conservation efforts in general. I'll do a couple of plugs here. First for Orcas Island's own Sea Doc Society, which doesn't do any right whale work specifically, but does a lot of awesome stuff for the Southern resident killer whales. And uh, the, the way that, that I view this conservation is, you know, anything we do positive for the killer whales, whether it's, it's taking down dams or recovering salmon, or protecting, a, declaring a piece of critical habitat and preventing drilling from happening, any of those things is helpful to the whole ecosystem. And so the, we, the work that CDOC is doing is not specifically related to right whales, but, uh, but benefits them uh, as well as, as all these other populations of whales. 
uh, a couple of friends, Lindsay, myself, and a couple other folks. I don't know if Kate's watching. If you are, Kate, hi. Uh, have started this organization called Save the North Pacific Right Whale. Uh, we can be seen at northpacificrightwhale.org. Uh, early stages of getting the ball rolling on, on some conservation stuff. And then, the, of course, this film we're working on. Uh, if you go there, you can find a link to the members only North Pacific right whale fan club that we're calling the Colossity Club. The Colossity being the name of these little bumps on the whale's face. Uh, so you can join the Colossity Club and it, that funding helps us uh, spread the word about the whales, finish our film, and then get started doing some behind the scenes uh, conservation work for these guys. So with that, I'm going to pop out of my PowerPoint and try and pull up two different film clips for you guys. Uh, and then I'll, I'll take some questions. So let's see. I'm going to do a new share. Wait, I'm going to stop that real quick. Let's see if this shows up. Okay, hold on just a second. Okay. While Kevin's doing that, you guys will be happy to know that the book Fathoms is at the library. It's actually, it was on the shelf this morning and so was buying, um, oh, here we go. Uh, one of the other books, and I'll tell you more about that later. Oh, you can keep talking. I ha haven't clicked play yet, I don't think so. Oh, yeah. all right. Um, the other one is Spying on Whales. That's also uh, on the shelf, it was this morning. And then the books uh, Right Whales by Phil Clapham that he mentioned, and the Dents on the Northwest about commercial whaling and the spirits of our whaling ancestors, that beautiful cover. Those are all on order. And Lavella just walked by a few minutes ago. There's actually a magazine called All Animals. And this month, or the, in the summer, this issue this summer has an article titled, Why Right Whales Still Need Our Help. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this book that she just, that Carol just mentioned, uh, it's going away in the green screen there, Spying on Whales. <laughs> Super cool, like, uh, just, uh, like kind of pop culture recap of what we know about whales right now and how we know it. And uh, it's written by this guy who's a curator for the Smithsonian uh, Institute, uh, maybe cetacean programs. Anyways, he's like an evolutionary biologist. So there's some super cool and new information in there about the evolution of whales that I find super fascinating. But yeah, I super recommend that book as well. Good summer read. All right, I'm going to hit play on here. If someone wants to give me, a, there's like a little bit of blank screen and silence and then four or five seconds in, you should start hearing music. So someone give me a thumbs up if that's happening. western part of Vancouver Island so we'll start heading down the west side of Vancouver Island um, today maybe shooting for Winter Harbor and we'll allow ourselves more time to spend in more open waters looking for different whales. 
species out here now. There was one seen on the west side of Vancouver Island in 2013. I feel better that we're in a territory that we know. Um, North Pacific right whales have been seen and I know the last couple of weeks I've really been itching to start the part of actually looking. Now we're out here, now we're looking. So I'm excited to start that new part of this journey. Today has been all right, a little bit better. As for my personal mental state, there's been a couple of times when I've been like, how in the world did Kevin convince me to come back on this boat? <laughs> but then like, there's moments when I'm just sleeping on the stern and I'm like looking up at the sun and I'm just feeling like warm and happy and I'm just like, how could I have said no? Like, there's no way. Like, it's gorgeous out here. Like, it's gorgeous. And we're seeing amazing life. We see otter earlier this morning. And like, porpoises going off our bout. We're doing something really awesome out here. There's been so many times when I've like told people to go on this sailing trip to find this North Pacific right whale. And they're like, I didn't even know that was a whale. And I'm like, exactly. We're trying to bring awareness to the species. Educate people. We're going out to find a North Pacific right whale, one of the most endangered populations of whale in the world right now. The cool thing about being out here is you never know what's going to pop up. And the anticipation of you could look over on your right shoulder and you could see a right whale is crazy. And it's not, it's not believable yet that we're out here and that we're, we're doing what, what we've talked about for months or for years for some of the crew members. I've definitely had that vision of seeing one and what it's going to be like and imagining the tears start streaming down my face and everyone freaking out and we're not allowed to run on deck, but I know I'm going to run on deck and I'm going to be running back and forth and screaming and um, trying to take photos and think about what it means for us to find one and the history of the North Pacific right whale and what's going on with it now with population and sightings and everything and it would kind of bring the whole project together to actually see one out here. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll show you guys one more. So these are, I, I like didn't say this super well earlier, but, but myself and a handful of other folks are making this film called Right Over the Edge, the search for the North Pacific right whale. Uh, and it is, uh, about our search for North Pacific right whale. That is like gonna be one of the intro scenes. It's like super rough draft and I have to screen a low res version just so it plays it all over Zoom. Uh, but just to give you a, a sense of, of what we're trying to do with the film. Uh, and I'm gonna show you one more clip, which is of a visit we got to do um, with a woman named Giselle Martin, who is, probably the world's coolest person. I, she, she lives in, in Tofino, um, just like uh, indigenous activist and has this like deep family connection to to whaling tradition up there. And so I'll, I'll, she says it all better than I do. So I'll see if do that, this, uh, let's see. And these, obviously, if it says map graphic in the film, we're going to have a map graphic, that sort of thing. Um, if there's any uh, digital map makers out there, hit us up. All right, here we go with Giselle. We're arriving in Tofino, and today we get to pick up Giselle Martin, an indigenous Can you hear it, Carol? woman who's going to bring us to an island where her ancestors hunted whales. My Kua's name is Tla'uk. I'm from the house of Ehozet from Tla'ukwe'et First Nation. And my colonial and French name is Giselle. We are in uh, an island which has lifted up my spirits for my whole life and happens to have a lot of whale bones and history on it. I don't know what goes through my head if I see a whale, but I know through my heart I get more excited. <laughs> I get more excited, I just get happy. So there are quite a few whale bones. This is part of a skull. 
said that the whole hill here is just made of, made of bones. And this island is a site where our nation came to come whale hunting. To be a whale hunter had to come from a lifetime of training, connection spiritually to those whales. Right here, there's a spot where they used to carry a boulder and walk from that point underwater to that point, back and forth, just preparing for the whale hunt. I haven't seen a living in the flesh right whale. But when my grandpa says this land is made of the dust of our ancestors, so there's probably the dust of them all around here as well. We're probably standing on right whales right now. The last traditional whale hunt that Tlokwait First Nation had was, I believe, in 1910. And there's a picture of a whale on the beach right there. Our family had a quota of 10 whales per year. Pretty sure it might be this one that's the right whale. And if not, it's this one. This is the closest we've gotten to seeing a right whale. We're arriving in. Okay, we get to pick up this. Oh, geez. Hold on. It's still playing in the background. Uh, it's going to bring us to an island where her ancestors hunted whales. Uh, okay. So, sorry about that. Um, yeah, the, uh, Giselle, it, it's not in that clip, but I think we'll, we'll probably use it elsewhere in the film, has this beautiful statement she she makes about how you can pray for the past and hope for the past as well as the future. And it just like so resonated with all of us about, you know, thinking about all the, the wrongs that we've caused uh, to the ocean and, and to these whales over the past couple hundred years. And, and uh, yeah, just a lovely person to spend time with, really shaped how I think about the conservation work I do and, and yeah, my relate personal relationship to whales. So uh, the film may be done in the next six years. No, I hope really done in the next, but by, by this fall, we're, we're pushing for it. But of course you have a busy sailing season and everything else coming up. So um, with that, I will again say thank you all so much for tuning in spending this beautiful, uh, perfect Northwest evening, learning about, uh, you know, a, a super rare and, and wonderful whale. Um, hey, Kevin. I'm happy to answer some questions now. And then I'll, I'll just restate the, may, I'll even type it into the chat, the, the websites, but it's, it's just northpacificrightwhale.org. And then if you're interested in these programs, the sailing programs we do, uh, then that's deepgreenwilderness.com. Hey, Kevin. Yes. Uh, before you do the question Q&A, because we might lose people um, if it lasts a, a yeah. while, I'm going to run a quick poll, two questions. Oh, yeah, that's right. If everybody could, um, you should be seeing it on your screens now, just two quick questions. And then um, while they're doing this, actually, you can go ahead and start doing the Q&A now. Yeah, let me see. Uh, do, do we have questions? Maybe if people want to put questions oh, in, in the in the chat let's see let's see i don't think we have any questions yet in the chat but i think that's a good place to put them and um as we're waiting i have to say when you said there were about 30 left i thought holy crap that's about how many people are on this zoom call <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. It, wow. it, it often gets put in these funny perspectives like that for me as well and and man it's it's a it's a very small amount of whales and uh we take hope from the you know gray whales came back from a few hundred uh low very low hundreds humpbacks came back from from the low hundreds uh as well and they're both at kind of their historic more or less population levels uh so uh you know it can happen and but it won't happen if we don't uh, do, uh, you know, really prevent all the, any harm that, that we are causing them currently, for sure. 
Um, I see one question that's easy to answer. What's the name of the speaker in the first film who wore glasses? That's Alyssa Biscotti Scott, who uh, was a former student of ours who we're insanely proud of because she's now running the San Juan Island Marine Mammal Stranding Network. If you've come across a uh, injured seal or a stranded seal pup or something like that, you may have had an interaction with her. Alyssa is super cool. That's the only question I got. And I'm probably happy to go skateboarding if no one has any other questions. So that's, that's easy. Great news on the whale sighting. What do we know about that? Oh, let's see. Okay, sweet. Um, we know, uh, well, one of the coolest things that we know about that is that that whale was found uh, by two researchers for Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, which is like Canada's version of NOAA. Uh, and it was a, it's the first time they've ever sent anyone out specifically to look for North Pacific right whales. Uh, and they found one, which is uh, special in its own right that Canada is caring to look because until now they they haven't the ones that have been found have been on on different uh, different cruises that you know looking for all whales or whatever it was and then the, the other cool thing is that it's this guy James Pilkington that was was on board uh, and and found it and he's found the first one in 2013 so the first right whale seen since 1951 and in, in British Columbia uh, he found, and then he was on board to find this, this next one, uh, this one they just found. And then this guy named Jared Towers, who is like, a uh, 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 phenomenal whale finder guy as well. And he does, he does survey work for DFO. All right. And that might be it. Is that it for questions? We got more. Okay. When the whales are spotted, uh, then what is, uh, so, so about asking about tr how we track the whales once we find them. And there's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, the, the most robust way is to tag them with a satellite tag. Uh, and that is only, and there's some risks associated with that. So it doesn't happen often. You also need to have very specific sea staked and close to the whale and all that to, to do this. But if you can get a satellite tag on one of those whales, then you can, the satellite will tell you where the whale is. Uh, they have not had great success with that. But I don't know what the longest deployment was, maybe two months, but I don't th even think that. And the whale, what, what Phil said, you know, to paraphrase was, well, that the whale showed us very much that it liked to stay in the Bering Sea or something like that. So the whale kind of it stayed right where it was when they tagged it. Um, but of course, we do have this wonderful way of, of using acoustics to track these whales. You can't track them as an individual that way, but you can say that say where they are by by hearing them. If you hear a right whale on a hydrophone, you know there was a right whale by the hydrophone. Um, let's see. What do we know about their food supply in terms of increasing the population? Uh, we. What I will say about changes in their food supply, it will very much be affected by climate change. And, and past that, what it will do to the food supply, I can't tell you. I, I can say that that place where their critical habitat is in the Bering Sea uh, is critical. It, it is used by them to such a high degree because of the oceanographic conditions there that relate to having been iced over in the winter. It makes this what's called a thermocline, like where the, a warm body of water meets a cold body of water. It makes this layer of two different bodies of water and that layer collects the copepods on it, it which means it's like a, I don't know, it's, it's like going to a, a grocery store rather than having to go pick the food. It's all collected there for them basically. And so that's why they use that one particular area so much. And in order for those conditions to set up, it has to freeze over in the winter. Um, and it hasn't like the last two or three winters uh, because of climate change. So that is one thing we can say about their food supply. Uh, but as far as how much there is to feed an increasing population, I don't know. Ooh, Captain Tom. Um, okay, nice. Say hi to your family. Oh, hi, mom. 
Yeah, and that's my mom's got a question and asking about acoustics and says, say hi, awesome. I, that maybe any more questions out there, type them in if you got them. Um, I'm gonna type in my email right now. And if you guys have any more questions, thoughts or whatever, uh, let's see, oh no, that's to everyone, there we go. Um, yeah, feel free to email me. Uh, and like I said, we have spaces on our on our space on our programs this summer, and we have some like unclaimed scholarships as well. So uh, definitely trying to get some kids on the water, looking for probably not looking for right whales, but looking for humpbacks and orcas this summer. Awesome. Oh, I see. Do you see my mom's got a camera on? Even hi, mom. And yeah, everybody, it's a family affair. Oh, and Dennis and Daryl. Okay, sorry to like nerd out on my family right now, you guys, but uh, there's a reason I am this way. They're part of it, yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, here we go. How well do the various whale species coexist, uh, the ones you showed tonight? Well, uh, we've never seen an ocean uh, in, since science started paying attention that had all the, the whale species in it to historic abundance. And so it's very likely that there was probably competition between different species of whales for, for krill and these like plankton food sources and, and for forage fish and things for, you know, that like fin whales and humpback whales are eating. And then, of course, there's orcas that eat whales, including right whales, I'm sure. Uh, and so they, how well they coexist, I think probably... Uh, depends on on the species of whale and and you know what the what's happening at the time um oh let's see do we have any u.s programs like this it's a, it's it's called the wise scheme which is the uk's training scheme for minimizing disturbance to marine wildlife um uh something that is cool that is that is happening is uh and it's been uh, promoted mostly by the Port of Vancouver, and uh, I think mostly as a way to say that they can have more oil, uh, oil can take, you know, sorry, oil tankers coming for the Keystone XL pipeline. But uh, it has been this program to get ships to reduce their speed going through the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea, which means that uh, they're less likely to. Uh, run into whales, of course, the, the whales are concerned mostly in this case is southern resident killer whales, but it also means a slower ship is a quieter ship. And so the Port of Vancouver has had this program, I don't know that it's going this summer, they piloted it the last couple of years, where if you volunteered to drive your container ship slower through this specific spot through the, through the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea, then you got reduced port fees. And so there are like, I, I don't know this, Carol, this, this program you mentioned here, but I know there are some really interesting ways to use industry to incentivize them to do the right thing. Uh, and so there's some really cool uh, creative tools to, to like work with these, you know, with, with right whales, of course, like it's shipping and fishing that are the two biggest causes of mortality. And there are some like, we're on the, very beginning stages on the Atlantic coast of coming up with some neat partnerships to, to have fisheries interact in, in less harmful ways for Atlantic right whales. We as North Pacific right whale uh, folks will are like tracking that pretty good. And, and once we have, you know, some evidence of how well that can work and how those, the commercial fishermen and, and conservationists are working together, we'll, we'll, you know, ideally make that some of that happen in the Bering Sea uh and and gulf of alaska which you know bering sea is the most productive commercial fishery for the for the u.s and north america really and, and is a heavily active fishery up there where these whales are, are living uh, okay let's see that might be it anybody else these q and a's on zoom are so funny it's, uh I'm looking forward to seeing you all in person. There's one. How do other fisheries compare to the bearing? Um, so that's a good question. And you know, the Bering Sea is 
the the fisheries of of concern for these whales uh, are ones that have long lines attached to the bottom. And so down off our coast, off Washington and Oregon, Northern California uh, is the Dungeness crab fishery, you know, and which uh, there is some cool precedent set for that right now where they are adjusting the timing of that based on humpback and gray whale presence, uh, which is very new uh, in the last year or two. And then, of course, in the Bering Sea, there's snow crab fishery, there's king crab. I don't know much about it at all, other than I know that it is, you know, those, those crab fisheries primarily are happening in the Bering Sea. Some are happening in the, in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, and then, you know, other fisheries up there are, are like cod, of course, salmon, these other ones that are probably not having as much of an interaction as far as whales getting entangled in the gear. But, but there's still boat presence and noise and that possibility of ship strength from those as well. Uh, was the whale that was just sighted found through acoustics? Uh, no, they just saw it, which is, I'm pretty sure, I haven't actually talked to I, either Jared or James, but my sense is that, that they just saw it and were, uh, these are two guys that are, I mean, they're probably the two best people in the North Pacific for spotting whales, other than Brian Gisborne, who I mentioned at the top of the program. And so I'm not surprised they were able to find the, that whale. Uh, if any, if anyone was going to, it would have been those two, but still super, super cool and special. And one thing that, that's really cool from that is it shows this pattern of right whales using Haida Gwaii and that northern British Columbia coast that is gonna let hopefully Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the Canadian feds think about putting some protections there for the whales, because that like, if you look at historic data where, where whalers were catching right whales 150 years ago, that spot shows up as a hot spot. And so it's clearly important to the whales. Um, you know, I, if they've seen three different whales there and three, three different whales of a population of 30 is a pretty big chunk of the population. Uh, and you got to assume there's, there's probably a handful of others that they didn't pull up. So, so like just seeing one whale means huge things for, for this population of size. Super cool that they found it. Lorian Stu are watching. Can't wait to see the film. Not a question, but hi, Lorian Stu. Thanks for tuning in. Um, awesome. Well, let's see if that's not if nothing else. Just a lot of family and friends saying hello. <laughs> it's sweet. Uh, we need to grow the, we need to grow the community. You guys we need some strangers on here. There are. So, uh, well, I think I'm going to tune out here in a sec and go skateboarding. Thanks everyone for tuning in and, uh, yeah, hit me up with any questions, send some, uh, whale stoked teens our way. We'll get them sailing this summer. Thank you, Carol and Orcas library. And, Bonnie from the library, so good to reconnect with you and, and all my other friends on Orcas. And so, yeah, uh, be in touch, folks. Thanks for spending your evening this way. Thanks, Kevin. And for those of you who uh, want to check anything out, uh, Lavella found this. This is the cover of that magazine with the article about why the right whale needs our help. And it's got pigs on the cover, but it's an article about whales. <laughs> and then uh, the Spying on Whales book, you see it's checked in right now, but someone may put it on hold during the call. And then um, we've got Fathoms uh, on the shelf as well, nonfiction section. These books both fill one of your book bingo squares if you participate in the adult book bingo for the summer reading program. And then these three are on order. Thanks very much, Tourette, for putting these on order. Uh, and with that, thanks very much for answering the poll questions. And Kevin, can't thank you enough. Super presentation, really important to hear and uh, can't imagine hearing it from someone more passionate. So thanks very much and hi to your family. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thanks, Carol. Hi to Tom for me and we'll see you guys at the beach real soon, I hope. So Sounds great. Thank you so much for hosting. All right, ciao everybody. Bye.